Hi, my name is Usama and I will start in Unitology Part 2. You can follow with me the Pediatric Board Study Guide from page 122 to page 128. In this section, we'll discuss newborn examination from head to toe. Apgar score was invented by Virginia Apgar in 1952 to quickly summarize the health of newborn infant after birth. Uh, we are using the acronym Apgar to make it easy to remember the five criteria of Apgar. A for color or appearance, P for pulse, a G for grimace or reflex irritability, a, a for activity or movement, and R is a, for a respiration or respiratory effort, APGAR. So if the baby is below, if the baby is below, this is zero, but his pink and limbs are below, this is one, completely pink is two, pulse absent is zero, less than 100, one, more than 100 is two. Uh, grimace or reflex irritability if the baby already vigorously crying this is two if the baby is not crying insert a catheter in the nose if is no response this is zero if baby is grimacing this is one if vigorously crying this is two uh, if there is no activity baby is limp or flaccid this is zero some flexion or some movement is one active and resisting extension this is two respiratory effort if is absent this is zero slow and irregular gasping is one uh, good and crying or vigorously crying this is two so if you have a baby uh, at one minute for example and you are uh, assisting the baby baby is vigorously crying you give two for respiration and two for grimace so you have four actively moving legs you have another two so six more uh, pulse more than 100 so you have eight and body's pink and limbs are below so you have nine so your abgar score in this case is nine so to assess Abgar score, you need to do it at one minute, then you repeat at five minutes. Also, you can repeat every five minutes in the first 20 minutes if it's needed. So Abgar score in the first minute between seven and 10, this is normal baby. Between four and six, this is moderately depressed. Between zero and three, this is severely depressed. Then you need to repeat at five minutes. If the Abgar score remains low, uh, uh, less than or equal five, this indicative of impaired transition and possible poor outcome. So you need to repeat the Abgar score every five minutes as you are resuscitating the baby to uh, check for response to resuscitation. Characteristics of newborn crying can be suggestive of a possible underlying medical problem. Vigorous and lusty cry, this is healthy. This is the cry of healthy full-term infant. Weak cry is suggestive of infection. High-pitched cry can be associated with Cornelia de Linge syndrome, Credisha syndrome. Horse cry can be associated with hypothyroidism or vocal cord paralysis. Routine measurement of temperature after birth is very important. Persistent abnormal temperature, normal temperature environment is abnormal and must be investigated. Step number one, check the environment. If the baby is having hypothermia, warm the baby, place the baby under a radiant warmer or an incubator. Recheck the temperature again. If the baby continue to have hypothermia, this is serious and has to be investigated. Possibilities are uh, sepsis, hypoglycemia, hypothyroidism, or hypoxia. If the baby is having fever or hyperthermia, uh, check the environment for possibility of overheated. Uh, if the baby is uh, overwrapped, uh, then re-measure the temperature again. If the, if the baby continue to have a fever, this is serious and also has to be investigated. Possibilities are sepsis, adrenal hemorrhage, or intracranial hemorrhage. Very important to know that sepsis is commonly associated with hypothermia or temperature instability in neonatal period. Uh, than fever. Fever is more common in older infants. Skin examination. Aplegia cutis congenita is simply area without a skin can be seen in the scalp, extremities, trunk, varies in size, depth, and location. Very common to be isolated, 70% of cases. So if you have a newborn or infant with cutis aplegia, you do not need to order a chromosomal or genetic studies. Unless it is associated with other anomalies, for example, midline defect. Consider trisomy 13 in this case. Uh, very important to be able to differentiate cutis aplegia from nevus sebaceous of Jadison. Nevus sebaceous of Jadison is hairless, hairless skin. Here there is no skin. Here is hairless skin. The skin here is orange, yellow, uh, smooth or somewhat velvety surface, uh, slightly raised. There is a risk of malignancy here. So a uh, recommendation here, most of experts, they recommend to remove this, this skin before puberty because of risk of malignancy as the child is aging. Here, the treatment is supportive. Surgery rarely required. So again, very important to know, cutis aplegia by itself, you do not need to order genetic studies. 
It is common to see in newborn and young infants blue hands and feet when they are exposed to colder temperature. This is normal, this is benign, well known as acrocyanosis, require reassurance. But if you see generalized cyanosis or central cyanosis, blue lips, gums, and tongue, this is uh, indicative of significant hypoxemia. This is serious. This can be associated with cardiac respiratory or meth hemoglobinemia. Acrocyanosis is benign. Generalized or central cyanosis is serious. Very important to look at the skin color when you are examining a newborn. If the skin is pale or the newborn is having pallor, think about causes of anemia, uh, poor perfusion, ask about history of abruptio placenta or placenta previa. If the skin is mottled, which is well known as cutis marmorata, think about cold environment to warm the baby. Also, sepsis and hypothermia can be associated with cutis marmorata. If the skin is deeply red, this is pellithora, check the hemoglobin and hematocrit. Polycythemia can cause that and watch for jaundice and hypoglycemia. Ask about maternal diabetes. If you have PTQI in localized area, this is benign, but if it's generalized, this is, can be associated with sepsis and thrombocytopenia. This is a four-day-old boy with blotch erythematous uh, macules, which is flat red lesions uh, on the trunk and face and extremities. And if you raised red lesions or multiple papules and a few pustules, what is the most likely diagnosis? This is a classic presentation of erythema toxicum. Erythema toxicum is a benign self-limited condition very common to be seen in newborn infants and requires reassurance. Uh, the onset in the first or second day of life uh, presents with discrete erythematous blood macules or patches, each with a central papule physical or uh, pustules. Uh, it may cluster and form erythematous uh, plaque. The rash here is filled with eosinophil. This is important and I like to ask about this uh, uh, in the board exam. The process lasts a week or less. If it lasts longer than that and doesn't go away or start to go through stages, you may think about uh, incontinentia uh, pigmenti, especially if the presentation in a girl. Of course, incontinentia pigmenti is incompatible with life in boys. Uh, management is reassurance. This is a newborn boy presents with multiple pustules in the face and the body and 10 days later this pustules start to be macules with hyperpigmentation. So the key word here, pustules uh, after birth uh, in the newborn period and later on these pustules start to change to be macules with hyperpigmentation. What is the most likely cause of this condition? This is a classic presentation of transient neonatal pustular melanosis. From the name transient means benign, self-limited. Uh, neonatal presents after birth. Uh, pustular uh, means pustules and followed by melanosis or hyperpigmented macules. The cause is unknown. It is a benign condition usually resolved in several days. Clinical presentation superficial pustules appears in the face and the body followed by pigmented macules in the skin. Presents at birth. The brown macules may persist for several months. The rash uh, or the rashes are filled with or these pustules or this cloudy material is a polymorph nuclear leukocytes without organism. So if you do a gram stain, will show no organism, but just uh, leukocytes or uh, white blood cells. And in the cases of erythema toxicum, remember it is eosinophil. In cases of transient neonatal pustular melanosis is filled with polymorph nuclear leukocytes. The management is reassurance, no cream, no antibiotic, just teach the parents about the course of the illness. The first example of uh, the common benign newborn rashes is salmon patch. Salmon patch is a pink uh, patch appears uh, in the middle uh, or commonly appears in the middle of the forehead and is well known also as nevus simplex or angel kisses. Appears at birth and fades with time require reassurance. It may show the outline uh, into adulthood uh, when the person become nervous or the skin become flushed. Uh, the next one is a stork bite similar to salmon patch uh, but appears in the nape of the neck as a pink patch and decrease in intensity with time but may persist also into adulthood. Next one is Mongolian spot. Mongolian spot is a blue-gray lesion these lesions tends to feed over several years, but may not disappear completely. It is benign and require reassurance. No evaluation is necessary. The next one is milia. Milia is a cyst filled with keratin. Appears in the face, 
can appear in the gums and also over uh, the uh, hard or soft palate. Uh, it is a benign condition and disappear or resolve with time require reassurance. Another uh, common uh, benign newborn rash is sebaceous hyperplegia. It is uh, raised lesions uh, on the nose uh, of the newborn. It is more yellow than the milia and the results of maternal uh, androgen exposure. It is a benign finding and disappears spontaneously, requires only reassurance. Cutis marmorata or mottling of the skin. You will see the skin here of different color, commonly seen uh, in infants when they are cold and disappear when you warm the infant. Head examination. Look at the shape of the head. Be familiar with the sutures of the skull, metopic sutures, coronal sutures, sagittal suture, lambdoid sutures, and posterior fontanelle. This is a parietal bone. Very common to see uh, after uh, birth through the vaginal canal overlapping because of the pressure, overlapping parietal bone. This is benign, uh, but very important to distinguish that from a premature fusion, uh, early or premature fusion of uh, sutures, like in cases of craniosynostosis. Overlapping parietal bone is uh, common and benign and will resolve spontaneously. Anterior fontanelle is uh, open, soft, and flat uh, at birth. Measures less than 3.5 cm, uh, about 3 fingers width. Usually closes between 7 and 19 months. It is usually flat if it's bulging indicative of an increased intracranial pressure but can be bulging when the baby is crying. Uh, sunken fontanelle indicative also of dehydration. Uh, posterior fontanelle is very small, uh, often fingertip size or just barely open. Usually close between 1 and 3 months. Beyond this time, if it stays open, uh, consider hypothyroidism. If you are examining a newborn after birth and you see swelling uh, in the head, the swelling is diffuse, soft, sometimes crosses a suture line if it's uh, big. Uh, this is a caput succedinum. Uh, this is benign. It is because of edema and the pressure in the uterus or vaginal canal. Uh, the course it will disappear within one week. This is different than cephalhematoma, which is firm and usually limited and does not cross the suture line at, as we will see in the next slide. On the other hand, if you see the swelling is uh, localized, firm or tense, uh, it is cephalhematoma and never cross the suture lines. It's because of bleeding under the periosteum. Here is edema above the, peri the periosteum. In cases of, of caput succedinum, the edema is above the bone, above the periosteum. Uh, this can be associated with linear fracture and hyperbilirubinemia. Any newborn with cephalhematoma need to watch for jaundice. X-ray film or CT scan if skull fracture is suspected, usually resolve within two to three weeks, much longer than uh, caput succedinum. Aspiration is rarely required. Subgaleal hemorrhage is blood under the aponeurosis that covers the scalp. This yellow line here is the aponeurosis. Blood under the aponeurosis and above the periosteum is subgaleal hemorrhage. Let's review from outside in. If you have edema above the aponeurosis is well known as caput succedinum. If you have blood under the aponeurosis and above the uh, periosteum is well known as subgaleal hemorrhage. Blood under the periosteum is cephalhematoma. So subgaleal hemorrhage is above the periosteum and cephalhematoma is below the, uh, below the periosteum. If you have blood under the skull, bone, and above the dura is well known as epidural hematoma. The cause of subgaleal hemorrhage is rupture of emissary veins associated with vacuum deliveries. It can be associated with hereditary uh, coagulopathy, consumptive coagulopathy due to massive bleeding. Patient should be monitored for hypotension and jaundice, typically resolves spontaneously within two to three weeks. Plagiocephalus abnormal head shape. The most common cause is positional or deformational plagiocephaly. Like in this infant, they prefer to be looking towards the left side. If you look at here, the occiput ear is flat and the, and the ear is displaced anteriorly and there is a frontal bossing on the same side. This is normal, this is benign, require reassurance. If you look at this case here, this is an example of a premature fusion of a lambdoid suture on the left side. So uh, the occiput here is flat, the ear is displaced posteriorly instead of anteriorly, and the frontal bossing on the opposite side. So the treatment here is reassurance, the treatment here is surgery. Uh, 
uh, very important to know that uni, uh, unilateral or unilamdoid synostosis is not the most common form of synostosis. The most common form of synostosis is a premature fusion of sagittal suture and the head in this case will be very elongated or well known as scaphocephaly. How to diagnose craniosinostosis? It is diagnosed based on the clinical presentation, abnormal head shape, palpable ridging of suture, large head. For example, if you have an infant with premature fusion of sagittal suture, the head will be very elongated, scaphocephaly, and the head circumference will be crossing percentiles upward, macrocephaly, not microcephaly. Microcephaly make it unlikely. If you want to confirm the diagnosis, a skull radiograph is enough anteroposterior view, lateral and water view. This is enough. There is no need to order three-dimensional reconstruction fancy CT scan. There is no need for that. It is not required. This is diagnosed clinically and if you want to confirm the diagnosis with a skull radiograph. Uh, otherwise, you refer to a neurosurgeon with no need to order CT scan. Traumatic epidural, subdural and subarachnoid hemorrhage, the clinical presentation, megalocephaly, bulging fontanel, unexplained anemia, jaundice, uh, and seizures. The most common uh, type uh, of intracranial bleeds in full-term infants uh, after difficult delivery is subdural hemorrhage because of tearing of uh, uh, bridging blood vessels. Uh, very important to keep a child abusing differential if this occurred after hospital discharge. Risk factors, a large head, difficulty deliveries, prolonged labor and breach, a precipitous delivery, an instrumented delivery, diagnosis, CT scan or MRI. Eye examination. You have to perform a red reflex in all newborn before discharge. You have to have an ophthalmoscope with you. It make the room dark dimmed room stand one arm distance from both eyes and dial zero lens in order to be able to see red reflex correctly uh, you have to have red reflex in both eyes equal if you have uh, one eye is white white reflex or both eyes they have a white pupillary reflex you have to know the differential diagnosis which is cataract like in cases of galactosemia and congenital rubella infection retinoblastoma retinopathy or prematurity uh, and retinal coloboma. If you have an infant or newborn with white pupillary reflex, you have to refer immediately to a pediatric ophthalmologist. If you are examining the eye and you see one part of the iris is missing, this is well known as coloboma, which is a hole in the iris. This can be non-syndromic or syndromic if it's associated with other anomalies like a charge syndrome. A charge syndrome uh, associations a coloboma, heart defect, atresia uh, quani or uh, quanal atresia, which is complete blockage of nasal passages, can be unilateral or bilateral, retarded growth, developmental delay, learning disabilities, gen genital abnormalities, for example, micropenis, undescended testes, ear abnormalities, middle and inner ear abnormalities. Early diagnosis of strabismus and a prompt referral is very important to prevent amblyopia or vision loss of the affected eye. Strabismus can be caused by uh, refractive errors, cataracts, a problem with retina or optic nerve. Very important to know how to differentiate between true strabismus and pseudostrabismus which can be caused by epicanthal fold or facial asymmetry. The way to do that with a corneal light reflex. Stand two feet away from both eyes uh, in the center and direct the light to both eyes. The uh, light reflex should be centered in both pupils equally. If it's deviated like in this example, this is abnormal. If this problem is persistent, refer to pediatric ophthalmologist. Variable, uh, variable alignment in the first two months of life is normal. Uh, and usually most of the infants will outgrow with no treatment. If this problem persists beyond this time, refer to pediatric ophthalmologist. Also very important to have the red reflex equal in both eyes. If it's more bright in one eye than others, also refer to pediatric ophthalmologist. Drooping of eyelid or ptosis causes congenital myasthenia gravis Horner syndrome. So good maternal history will help you with the diagnosis of congenital myasthenia gravis, it's checking the arm for a possible brachial plexus injuries and the clavicle for fracture will help with the diagnosis of Horner syndrome. We'll discuss more uh, details about brachial plexus injuries in the next few slides. Subconjunctival hemorrhage, which is blood under the conjunctiva, is common after birth trauma. It resolves spontaneously over a period of time, requires only reassurance, so the treatment only time, no medicine is required. 
congenital glaucoma or increased intraocular pressure is suspected when you see the cornea is enlarged more than 11 millimeter in diameter newborn cornea normally between 9.5 to 10.5 millimeter in diameter when you see the cornea become progressively cloudy this is considered a ophthalmologic emergency and require immediate referral immediate consultation to a pediatric ophthalmologist very important to know this can cause vision loss and the diagnosis confirmed with measuring the intraocular pressure ear examination ear malformation commonly associated with urogenital malformation so it is very important to rule out renal anomalies or urogenital anomalies if you have an infant or newborn with microtia or malformation of ears this can be isolated this can be syndromic or non-syndromic a preolicular pit syntax is different uh, is not uh, common uh, for a preolicular pit syntax to be associated with urogenital anomalies so there is no need uh, routinely to order renal ultrasound if there is no family history of renal disease no family history of deafness if the infant or newborn passed the hearing test there is no need to do renal ultrasound not routinely recommended for pit syntax it is recommended for uh, ear malformation like in this case Nose examination, nasal stuffiness after birth can be a sign of drug withdrawal. Ask about maternal intake of addictive drugs during a pregnancy. Also look for other signs of neonatal abstinence syndrome, for example, jitterness, tremors, high-pitched cry, and other signs. Quinal atresia means a complete blockage of nasal passages. If it's unilateral, will not cause respiratory distress. If it's bilateral, will cause respiratory distress and cyanosis while feeding and disappears while crying. Snuffles, rhinorrhea, and saddle nose uh, is a common association of congenital syphilis. Very important to know. Mouth examination, epstein pearls. It is a small white papules uh, seen in the midline of the palate. It is very common and benign and disappears with time require reassurance. Uh, bones and nodules, it is a white bumps on the uh, upper uh, gum. It is commonly seen in uh, the lateral aspect of the gum and on the periphery of the palate as well. The exact etiology is unknown, but it is believed uh, is a remnant from the dental lamina. It is benign, benign and will disappear with time. Ranula and the mucosil. It's a benign mass comes out of the floor of the mouth because of retention of mucus. Resolve spontaneously in most of the cases. High arch palate, usually associated with syndrome. Pierre Robin syndrome or sequence. It's a sequence because of very small mandible, micrognathia, and this will cause retroglossoptosis, and uh, this will cause difficulty with breathing or respiratory distress, and also can be associated with cleft palate and feeding difficulties. Cleft lip and cleft palate is managed by a multidisciplinary team. The leader of the team is the pediatrician. Once the baby is born, you have to ensure there is no associated congenital anomalies. Uh, uh, you have to ensure the proper feeding and the adequacy of feeding, provide lactation consultant if it's breastfeeding, a Heberman feeder if it's formula feeding, uh, counsel the mother for the risk of recurrence of otitis media with effusion, monitor the growth, especially the weight gain because of feeding difficulties. At age of three months, a refer uh, for repair of cleft lip and the placement of ventilation uh, tube or ear tubes because of otitis media with effusion. At nine months, uh, start speech therapy. Between nine and 12 months, a repair of cleft palate. So at, at three months is the repair of cleft lip if it's associated. Uh, at nine months uh, or between nine and 12 months is the time of repair of cleft palate. So the team will include pediatrician, ENT, speech therapy, maxillofacial surgeon, dentist, orthodontist, genetist, genetic counseling, social worker. Uh, so it's not an easy condition to manage. No one will manage it by him or herself. Is a, a team uh, to manage this condition successfully. If you have supernumerary teeth, it is usually very loose and easy to be removed with a little pinch so it is okay to remove it but it, if it is hard it means it is true milk teeth and should not be removed ankyloglossia or tongue tie tongue tie means that the tongue the tongue is tethered to the floor of the mouth by a membrane and this can restrict the motion of the tongue and interfere with feeding and speech if, when you need to do frenulotomy, when you need to cut it, if it's interfering with feeding or speech, otherwise no need to uh, cut it or do frenulotomy. 
Super numerary nipple or extra nipple, common and considered minor anomalies. Widely spaced nipples is associated with excessive nocal skin, uh, lymphedema, uh, t consider Turner syndrome, order chromosomal studies, echocardiogram, and other investigation for Turner. Breast hypertrophy, like in this case, is common because of maternal hormone. Engorgement, engorgement may increase in, during the first few days, but usually resolve. Lung examination, if you have a newborn with grunting, nasal flaring, retractions, uh, tachypnea, hypoxia, this can be transient in the first few hours after birth and will, will known as transient tachypnea of newborn. But if it persists beyond the 24 hours, it is not a transient tachypnea of newborn. You have to search for other causes. If the respiratory rate persistently more than 60, this is abnormal. Like this is a one day old girl with respiratory distress hypoxia. Chest X-ray here is showing low lung volume and diffuse granular appearance and air bronchogram. This is a classic presentation of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. Unilateral movement of the chest is abnormal because this can be associated with phrenic nerve palsy, diaphragmatic hernia, pneumothorax. You need to order a chest x-ray. In this case here you see the bowel and the intestinal loops are in the left side of the chest, pushing the structure to the right side. You see here shift of the trachea to uh, the right side and the heart occupying the right side of the chest. This is diaphragmatic hernia. Cough is abnormal in newborn. If you have a newborn with cough, you need to investigate for pneumonia, reflux, aspiration. It is not normal for a newborn to have cough. Point of maximal cardiac impulse is the point where the cardiac impulse can be best palpated on the chest wall. The location of uh, BMI is uh, between 4th and 5th intercostal space just medial to the midclavicular line if it is displaced if it is displaced to the right side this is abnormal you need to do a chest x-ray to look for pneumothorax decastrocardia diaphragmatic hernia or a space occupying lesion bradycardia less than 80 beats per minute is abnormal is significant it's a bad sign when a baby newborn is having a slow heart or bradycardia this can be a sign of sepsis asphyxia increased intracranial pressure hypothyroidism congenital heart disease or heart block tachycardia is different if the baby's crying is normal for the heart rate to be elevated or if the nurse is trying to take uh, blood work or blood culture or the baby is hungry this is normal for the heart rate to be elevated but persistent tachycardia more than 180 beats per minute is abnormal this can be associated with fever hypovolemia anemia tachyarrhythmia hyperthyroidism or drug withdrawal it is common to hear a heart murmur after birth they are usually benign murmurs usually due to transient changes in the postnatal circulation for example closing ductus Pathological murmurs, 8% of murmurs at birth are associated with congenital heart diseases, so they are not common. Murmurs usually require workup when you need to do a workup or echocardiogram. If the murmur is persistent after the first day of life, uh, associated with cyanosis, of course, evidence of poor perfusion or poor feeding. Measure blood pressure in both arms and legs. If blood pressure is 20 millimeter of mercury, or more higher higher in the arms than in the legs this should prompt for further investigation for example echocardiogram if you try to feel the femoral pulse and you cannot feel it absent the femoral pulse this is a red flag for co-architation of aorta so very important to know if you do not diagnose a co-architation of aorta early if it's severe once the doctors start to close, the infant may present with poor feeding, irritability, tachypnea, tachycardia, and uh, usually progress to congestive heart failure. So very important to know. And it is ductal dependent lesion. Uh, very important to know also that systolic blood pressure normally in a term infant less than 12 hours, usually between 60 and 90 millimeter of mercury. Abdominal examination. It is normal to be able to palpate the liver edge one to two centimeter below the right coastal margin in newborn. If the liver edge in newborn or neonates more than 3.5 centimeter, this is considered hepatomegaly. If the liver edge is more than two centimeter in children, this is considered hepatomegaly. Regarding the spleen, normally tip of the spleen palpable one to two centimeter below the left coastal margin normally in one third of newborn. 
but it has to be soft, round, and smooth, not firm, not irregular. If it is firm and irregular, it has to be investigated. If the tip of spleen is more than one to two centimeter below the left costal margin or below the costal margin, it has to be investigated as well. The most common cause of neonatal abdominal mass is multicystic dysplastic kidney disease. Usually diagnosed prenatally and the next step when you have a prenatal diagnosis of multicystic dysplastic kidney disease is to perform renal ultrasound after birth uh, and the usually the renal ultrasound will show a kidney with multi-cyst that varies in size and shape and these cysts usually they contain dysplastic tissue. Uh, these patients or these uh, infants they need to be monitored for recurrent urinary tract infection, hypertension uh, and also there is a risk of malignancy so close uh, monitoring is very important. Performing VCUG after birth is controversial some authors they recommend if there are if there are two normal renal ultrasound showing the other kidneys healthy with no malformation there is no need for VCUG. A subcapsular hematoma of the liver is caused by traumatic delivery and can be diagnosed with abdominal ultrasound. Umbilical hernia is common, is usually benign, is a self-limited condition. Management to observation, reassure the parents uh, these defects or uh, umbilical hernia close by age of 4 to 5 years of age. Any defect or any umbilical hernia persists beyond 4 to 5 years of age will require referral and surgical repair. Inguinal hernias are different than umbilical hernias. Is it okay to wait in inguinal hernias? The answer is no. Inguinal hernias do not spontaneously heal. There is a high risk of incarceration. Signs and symptoms suggestive incarceration is uh, poor feeding, refusal to feed, inconsolable cry, the mass become edematous and firm. Do not use trans illumination to roll out incarceration because edematous bowel can trans illuminate. Uh, it must be repaired surgically. A surgical consultation at the time of diagnosis is a must. Repair on an elective basis should be performed after the diagnosis is confirmed. If you suspect incarceration, in this case, surgery will be emergent. Hydrocele is common. Hydrocele without hernia usually disappears without surgery. Hydrocele that it changes in size or persists is suggestive of associated indirect inguinal hernia. Proteinal communication exists. Surgical correction will be indicated at this point. How would you differentiate between these two conditions? Sometimes it's difficult, so ultrasound is helpful. Referral to surgeon. Uh, trans illumination is not reliable to differentiate between these two conditions. Abdominal wall defects. We have two conditions here to differentiate: omphalocele and gastrous cases. Omphalocele is in complete closure of the abdominal wall. Herniation of the mid gut may contain liver, spleen, and other organs covered with a membrane. Gastrous cases is a small and large intestine sitting outside and is not covered with a membrane. Omphalocele is four times a higher risk than gastrous cases to be associated with other anomalies. For example, bequith Wedemann syndrome. So careful examination, uh, screening for other uh, associated anomalies like echo echocardiogram, uh, uh, doing abdominal ultrasound. Both conditions are uh, repaired surgically. Very important to uh, cover the defect with non-adherent dressing to keep the body heat and moisture. Monitor for fluid and electrolytes. Parenteral nutrition may be required. Uh, a surgical consultation as soon as the diagnosis is made. Examination of umbilical artery after uh, birth is very important. Uh, umbilical artery normally it has two arteries and one vein. Two arteries and one vein. Uh, sometimes the baby will be born with just a single umbilical artery. Very important to know that 85% of newborn with single umbilical artery are healthy. No other anomalies associated. Possible associations, the most common is kidney, congenital kidney abnormalities. So renal ultrasound will be helpful in this case. Other anomalies or other rare chromosomal abnormality can be associated with single umbilical artery, trisomy 13 and trisomy 18 and other uh, triploidy. So a physical exam will be helpful to suggest these conditions. Separation of umbilical cord is a common question parents always ask. We have to know the normal. The umbilical cord usually separates from the umbilicus between 1 and 8 weeks after birth. If it stays more than that beyond this time, if it's more than 8 weeks or 2 months, it, this may signify an underlying immune disorder, for example, leukocyte adhesion deficiency, which is very rare. 
Umbilical cord care is very important, very important to, to teach the parents about the risk of emphalitis and how to recognize inflammation around the umbilicus because this can progress to necrotizing uh, fasciitis and serious complications. Uh, this is based on an article published in Pediatrics in Review in August 2016. Uh, we have two recommendations here, high source countries uh, and for in-hospital birth, just a dry cord care. No application of topical substances, no alcohol, nothing to be applied. A limited source countries or for outside hospital birth application of topical chlorhexidine. So a general recommendation, hand washing, keep it dry, keep it uncovered. No need to apply any uh, material like garlic or uh, coins or a bandage or any, just to keep it uncovered, keep it dry, wash the hands. Uh, this is the recommendation for high source countries and for in hospital birth, dry cord care, no alcohol, nothing to be applied. It's very important to examine female genitalia to make sure there is no ambiguous genitalia. Vaginal discharge, wide discharge from the vagina after birth is normal. Sometimes it's bloody and this is normal too because of withdrawal of maternal hormone. This can cause even a visit to ER because of blood in diaper. Reassure the parents it is maternal hormone withdrawal. Careful examination of male genitalia to rule out any associated problem, for example, hypospedias, abyspedias, cordy, ambiguous genitalia. Very important to be able to differentiate between true length of the penis and uh, to be able to differentiate between micro penis and burid uh, penis. Uh, the uh, term boy, term boys, penile length is between 3 and 4 centimeters. This is normal. Less than 2.5 centimeter is abnormal. The way to measure it is to use the rigid roller uh, applied against the symphysis pubis upright. Then stretch the or gently uh, stretch the penis upward till the point of increasing resistance. In this way, you will be able to have the true length of a penile uh, shaft. If it's less than 2.5 centimeter, hormonal workup is indicated and referral to pediatric endocrinologist. Prepuce is usually adherent, so advise the parents not to forcibly uh, retract the, uh, the foreskin. It is not recommended anymore. Cordy is fairly common, which is uh, the, uh, the penis will be uh, curved downward, commonly associated with hypospedias and more obvious, more obvious during erection, even in infants. It is uh, very important to know that it is contraindicated to uh, circumcise an infant with cordy or with hypospedias or both together. So once you have a diagnosis of cordy, no, no circumcision, just to refer to pediatric urologist. Epispedias can occur in the dorsum of the penis but is less common than hypospedias. Either one hypospedias or epispedias is a contraindication to do circumcision. Testes normally in the scrotum in term infants but may be palpated in the upper scrotum or in inguinal canal in preterm infants. Neonatal testicular torsion in the clinical presentation varies according to the timing of torsion before birth. If torsion occurs in prenatal period far from birth, you will have absent or vanished the testes. If torsion occurs several weeks, like in this case before birth, you will have regular, firm, pinless scrotal mass smaller than smaller than contralateral normal testes. If torsion occurs several days before birth, in this case you will have firm, painless mass bigger or similar in size than contralateral normal testes. If torsion occurs a few days or hours before birth, in this case you will have signs of inflammation in large, reddish and painful. Any infant or newborn with neonatal testicular torsion, you have to consult pediatric urologist in person. Do not waste time with imaging studies. Ambiguous genitalia. If you have an infant with a small penis or microphyllus after you measure it, as we mentioned before, a bifid scrotum, large clitoris, pigmented, fused vulva, initial laboratory screening, chromosomal analysis, endocrine screening, serum chemistries and electrolyte for possible uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, androgen receptor level, 5-alpha uh, reductase uh, type 2 level genetic and endocrinology consultation. Back and extremities. Neonatal brachial plexus pulses. The risk factors for brachial plexus injuries, large babies, uh, shoulder dystocia, forceps delivery because of traction on the brachial plexus. The most common and the best prognosis is herbs palsy because of injury to the upper trunk uh, C5 and C6. 
uh, the injury most of the time is just a stretch, a stretch of the nerve. The clinical presentation of herpes palsy is shoulder will be abducted and internally rotated, elbow will be extended and pronated, and the wrist will be flexed. And very important to know the hand will be in a fist, which is waiter tip position. But the grasp reflex will be normal. And if you do moral reflex, it will be asymmetric, will be normal in this side, will be absent on this side. Very important to know that herpes palsy is the best prognosis, 80% complete recovery within the first three months, 90% recovers by 12 months. Complete brachial plexus palsy from the name is complete injury to all roots of brachial plexus is a total palsy from C5 to T1. In this case, it makes sense that the arm will be just limp and flaccid. Clumpic palsy is injury to lower trunk of brachial plexus from C8 to T1, and this very close to sympathetic ganglia, and sympathetic, th sympathetic ganglia can be affected, and one third of the cases can be associated with Horner syndrome. The clumpic palsy mainly affects the hand, so you will have absent grasp reflex. Remember, in herpes palsy, you have grasp reflexes positive. Here is absent, is negative. And you will see the hand, the wrist is extended, and fingers are flexed and is well known as claw hand. Bad prognostic sign, Horner syndrome, and phrenic nerve injury. Phrenic nerve injury means avulsion injury because phrenic nerve receives mainly the innervation from the cervical but some innervation from the brachial plexus. So if you have avulsion injury and you do x-ray and you see elevation of the diaphragm, this means a phrenic nerve injury. This is a bad prognostic sign. It is very important to understand the neurological types of brachial plexus injuries to be able to explain to parents the outcome and the prognosis of these injuries. The first and most common is neuropraxia lesions, which is just a stretch of the nerve, just a stretch of the nerve uh, without disruption. This is reversible. Uh, recovery is usually complete with no residual symptoms. The second type is axonotemesis. Axonotemesis is just a disruption of the nerve and the sheath is intact. The sheath is intact. The recovery here is variable. So, but most of the time the infant or uh, the child will have some residual, some residual or some functional limitations. The next one and the worst prognosis one is neurotemesis, which is complete sever or avulsion injury of the nerve. As you see, a complete disruption. Here, the recovery is impossible. Complete recovery is impossible. And this is the worst prognosis. What action do we need to take when we have a newborn with brachial plexus pulses? A chest radiograph to rule out phrenic nerve injury, to rule out elevation of diaphragm. Phrenic nerve injury is a bad prognostic sign commonly associated with avulsion injury. A clavicular fracture commonly associated with difficult deliveries. Rest of arm for few days. Gentle range of motion of the affected shoulder. Wrist extension splint and referral for physical therapy. Referral to orthopedics is recommended in these cases absence of full recovery by three months horner syndrome phrenic nerve injury clumbic palsy absent grasp reflex in the hand total palsy sacral dimple is very common in neonates usually they do not require imaging study but very important to know indications for ultrasound or mri on the spine if you have multiple dimples not just one or the dimple is large the diameter is more than five millimeter or the dimple is more than 2.5 centimeter above the anus. The higher the lesion, the higher the risk or the higher the association with any problem. A dimple outside the sacrococcygeal region in this area here, if it's outside, not in the middle. So if you see an ultrasound or MRI, for example, occult spinal dysrhythm, split cord malformation, dermal sinus tract, tethered spinal cord, intraspinal lipoma in these cases you need to refer to pediatric neurosurgeon all new needs they have to be screened for developmental dysplasia of the hip by performing physical examination barlow and ortolani what is barlow the idea of barlow if you are able to dislocate the head of the femur outside the acetabulum by holding the thigh as shown in the figure in adduction with gentle push uh, uh, downward if you are if you feel the head of the femur coming outside the acetabulum what is called the clunk this means the head is subluxable means a positive test 
Ortolan is the opposite. If you are able to relocate the head of the femur, relocate the head of the femur back to the acetabulum, you will feel a clunk by holding the thigh in abduction as showing in the figure with gentle push to inside. If you feel the head of the femur going back or you feel a clunk, this means the test is positive. If you have positive Barlow, or positive ortolani or both you need to refer to pediatric orthopedics with no imaging study if you feel just a click means that you are not able to dislocate you are not able to relocate this means a negative test it means you do not need to do uh, imaging study you do not need to refer clicks you do not need to refer you do not need to do imaging studies if your exam is equivocal or if there is a positive family history or high risk factor like female or breach presentation either male or female you need to perform ultrasound at three to four weeks if hip ultrasound at three to four weeks not after birth if the ultrasound is positive refer to a pediatric orthopedics and if the ultrasound is negative continue to monitor with physical examination afterward in each well visit arthrogryposis means a congenital multiple joint contractures associated with short umbilical cord polyhydramnios sometimes associated with oligohydramnios pulmonary hypoplegia micrognathia and ocular hypertelorism polydactyly or extra digits if you have the extra digits on the ulnar side on the ulnar side on the medial aspect of upper extremities on the side of the little finger or if uh, you have the extra digit in the lower extremity on the lateral aspect or on the uh, fibular side or on the side of the little toe so uh, extra digit on the side of the little finger or little toe will be of a little concern is usually isolated condition and usually autosomal dominant. If you have the extra, extra digit in the upper extremity on the lateral side, on the radial side, on the thumb side, or in the lower extremity on the tibial side, on the medial side of the big toe will be of a big concern and usually syndromic and usually associated with other anomalies. It's a routine now, all newborn after birth, they receive ophthalmic erythromycin ointment within one hour after birth to prevent Neisseria gonorrhea ophthalmia neonatorum. This will not prevent the chlamydia ophthalmia neonatorum. All newborn routinely they receive now hepatitis B prophylaxis. If the mother hepatitis B negative, give hepatitis B vaccine only intramuscular after birth. If the mother is hepatitis B positive, you will give hepatitis B vaccine plus hepatitis B immunoglobulin and the baby should receive the second dose of hepatitis B vaccine at one month of age. It's a routine now, all newborn after birth, they must receive vitamin K to prevent hemorrhagic disease of newborn. Vitamin K is one milligram given intramuscular injection in the first few hours after delivery. This is the end of this presentation. Thank you for listening. This video is only for educational purpose and not intended to direct the care of any specific patient. Please consult your physician or the physician of your child for the correct diagnosis and the proper treatment. None of my videos can be superior or an alternative for the opinion of an experienced and licensed healthcare professional. Thank you again.